So uh, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for this uh, CSD speaker series seminar, part of our Monday Conflict Security and Development Research Group seminar series. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome two guest speakers today. Um, we have with us uh, Christine Backer, who's Professor of Political Science and International Relations uh, at University College London, UCL. Um, Christine's also Associate Re Research Professor at PRIO in Oslo. Um, she focuses on political violence and her research explores how states respond to opposition within their borders, uh, the dynamics of violence and self-determination struggles, post-war state building and wartime legacies, and geopolitical orientations in Russia's near abroad. And she draws on both quantitative and qualitative methods, including surveys and fieldwork in Northern Ireland, India, Guatemala, Canada, and post-Soviet states and de facto states. And joining Kristen is Kit Ricard, who's a PhD candidate at UCL, and a research assistant also at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, Prio. And his doctoral project, project focuses on how states affect foreign civil wars, with a specific focus on how diverging forms of external support shape relations among and within rebel groups. Now, um, both our speakers are going to be talking about a paper that they've recently authored, Legacies of Wartime Order, Punishment Attacks and Social Control in Northern Ireland, really important, really interesting topic that I know many on our MA programme and many of my colleagues um, will be really, really keen to hear more about. Um, so the way this will work is um, Kristen will begin. She will um, share her screen in the presentation um, and then hand over to Kit. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have a chance for questions from the audience as usual. Um, if you have a question, there is no chat, the usual little chat box. Instead, you put your question in the Q&A box. Um, and if you put your question in there, when it comes to the question time, I will then read out your questions on your behalf and direct it to the speakers um, and we'll get through all of those. Um, so if you put questions in as we go through the talk, that's great. And then we'll have some ready for, for when we come to question time. So without further ado, thank you, um, Kristin and Kit for joining us, much appreciated. And over to you, Kristin. All right, there, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, We're really excited to uh, share this uh, work with you and we look forward to your uh, questions and comments uh, at the end of this. I'm just gonna get rid of a little, okay, little comment box. All right, so uh, our paper is called Legacies of Wartime Order, Punishment Attacks and Social Control in Northern Ireland. And this slide here shows you two incidents that are described as paramilitary style attacks or so-called punishment attacks in Northern Ireland. And they happened in 2018 and 2019. These are just some examples uh, drawn to, at random from news stories. And they're attacks in which paramilitary groups attack members of their own communities. And important here, these are attacks that have happened 20 years after the Good Friday Agreement was signed. The first story here happened in September 2018 in Larne, which is northeast of Belfast. It's a predominantly Protestant area. And the attack was most likely conducted by a loyalist group, such as the UDA or UVF. Uh, a man uh, was attacked by sledgehammers in, in a brutal attack. The second story occurred last fall in Derry or Londonderry, a predominantly Catholic city. And this attack was most likely conducted by a Republican dissident group, such as the real IRA, continuity IRA or new IRA. A man was walking with a friend through a residential neighborhood when two hooded men approached him and shot him in the legs. Now in, in this attack, it looks like the man was taken by surprise, but sometimes there's less surprise to how these attacks uh, happens. The quote here is from a teenage boy in 2017. So my mommy visited me and said, listen, I've been talking to someone to try and sort it out to get someone to give you an easy shooting. I put my shoes on straight away and said, yes, let's get it over and done with. The first time they shot me, I only moved a bit. But the second time they shot me, I was screaming. It went right through and hit my main artery. It busted my whole knee bone. So this is an, an, an arranged or sorry, an agreed attack where you know, there's an arrangement made that you know, you're, you're gonna be a subject to, to an attack as a punishment um, and you know, show up at, this, uh, at a certain place and then you know, this attack will happen. And these attacks, these examples are not one-offs. Um, 
the figure here shows you the data from the police service uh, in Northern Ireland, and it shows you paramilitary style attacks since the Good Friday Agreement, so from 1998, and then the data goes up till 2018. And um, what we can see here is that you know these attacks have persisted in the so-called post-conflict or post-war uh, period you know more in the immediate aftermath of the good friday agreement but what's remarkable and what we are you know particularly concerned about in this uh, paper or what sort of motivates this paper is that you know the continuation of this uh, these attacks so we look at the last 10 years and these attacks have remained at a fairly you know steady rate in fact with some you know increase in later years and these attacks can come in the form of beatings, as we saw in the sledgehammer attacks, or in the form of, of shootings. And they happen in both communities, so both by in the name of uh, Republican paramilitary groups and in the name of loyalist paramilitary, um, para paramilitary group. And the shootings are sort of colloquially known as kneecappings. Um, they can be more or less brutal, depending on the the crime that these, or the offense that these attacks are meant to police. So they can sort of be clean in the sense that they're not busting someone's artery or kneecap, and they're called dirty if they do. Um, if it's a particularly severe um, type of offense that someone is being punished for, then you know, you, the person could get what's called a six pack where you know, the knees, ankles, and elbows um, are, um, are, are, are shot. If it's a less severe attack, it might be something that's called a clipping. So only, and I say only in quotation marks, a flesh wound rather than you know, through, through the kneecaps, for example. And what we see, so that's what these, you know, these attacks here in this, these figures are, are covering. And what we see is that there is a, um, it's a justice system that ranges, or a justice system in quotation marks, a punishment system that ranges from verbal warnings to beatings and shootings of various forms, some then sort of further up the scale potentially is that you're expelled from the community and then ultimately death. And paramilitary groups across Northern Ireland target people accused of antisocial behavior, drug dealing, and sexual offenses within their communities. That's typically the justification for conducting these attacks. And this is, uh, this is certainly the, you know, the story that we see in, uh, in the media when, when these attacks are covered. So you know, the question then that motivates our, our paper is you know, why do these attacks persist? Um, so we see that Republican loyalist paramilitary groups or individuals acting in their name are trying to exercise social control within their communities through so-called punishment attacks. And the question is, you know, how are they able to do so? Why do these practices persist? And you know, this is perhaps particularly puzzling in a case like Northern Ireland, which is a relatively strong and stable post-conflict, post-war state. There was a you know, peace agreement that many see as a you know, fairly successful peace agreement, uh, as there hasn't been a return to the levels of violence we saw during the 30 years of the Troubles. Um, and you know, there was a you know, there was a decommissioning and demilitary um, DDR uh, process uh, as part of the peace agreement. There was a security sector reform as part of the peace agreement to make the police more representative and accepted in both communities. And it's a peace process that has been backed by you know significant financial resources. Uh, surveys show that you know it's a peace process that overall has quite high levels of support. So in many ways it's puzzling that these practices, social control by non-state armed actors is continuing in this post-conflict uh, society. So that's the motivation of, uh, of, uh, of this study. In order to answer this question, we we go to the literature on rebel governance. We also look at literatures on criminal governance and literatures on um, wartime socialization. And we know, and many of, uh, you, know, many of you at King's know this uh, very well, that there's a, there is a growing literature on, um, on rebel governance and how armed actors are not just agents of violence, but they, are also, uh, they also engage in governance in wartime. Um, and 
Armed actors do this for a variety of reasons. They want to solidify their group strength and territorial control by taking on governance over the course of a conflict. Uh, it might signal their strength vis-a-vis -vis the state in the sense that they're able to govern and they're not you know, just, in quotation marks, armed actors. It gives them perhaps an aura of legitimacy, both towards their own community in the sense that they're taking on governance functions policing, for example, uh, or also or and or provides them with an aura of legitimacy outwards towards uh, the international community. And it might strengthen recruitment and popular support while preventing defection in the sense that, you know, they're controlling areas, but not just controlling them by being violent actors and uh, engaging in you know, their counter insurgency. Uh, campaign, but by providing governance. Now, this literature on rebel governance suggests that there's and there's a range of sort of public goods that armed actors um, are contributing to in wartime. At the minimal end, they can be trying to, they can try to take on the policing or security functions of governance, which is primarily what we saw in Northern Ireland. But then in other settings, we've seen armed actors take on you know, a range of public goods uh, provisions of so education and healthcare, and you know, take on state-like functions um, in wartime. There's also a research uh, in sociology on criminal groups and on gangs and mafia groups that suggests that, uh, again, that these actors aren't just agents of violence. They may also offer protection to the communities in which they're operating to gain some level of legitimacy and support within, uh, within their communities. Now, in this, these literatures, and particularly in this literature on wartime governance, one of the things that scholars often point out that is that you know, we need to focus on the fact that armed actors are providing or taking on these state light functions in wartime. They're trying to govern in various ways, and that's going to have legacies into the post-war period. But what we don't have much research on is, well, how do, you know, how do these practices or do these practices endure? And in, so that's where we see our contribution in the sense of trying to explore what some of these legacies of wartime order um, might be. And we make a, an argument, uh, a sort of two-step argument. Um, so first, we argue that there are top-down mechanisms for why wartime orders might persist into the post-war uh, period. Overall, our argument is that these wartime orders or wartime, wartime social control is sticky, and it's hard to dislodge these informal institutions that might emerge during years of armed conflict. Now, top-down, um, there's an instrumental logic in the sense that um, armed actors are engaging in this kind of behavior in the spoiler, um, in a, according to the logic of spoiling. Strategically, they may have political and operational reasons to maintain the orders that were, um, that they created or were emerged or were, cre were created uh, during the war. Politically, areas under social control by non-state actors serve to delegitimize and denormalize the state. And logistically, these areas and the people within them can provide these groups with safe haven resources and recruits. So groups might have these reasons, be they political or criminal, for wanting to keep these orders alive in the post-conflict period. And they're going to do so in areas uh, where the predecessors controlled, uh, exercised social control in the, during the war because this is easier than setting, these, um, setting it up in new areas. So we would expect to see a sort of continuity of you know, where you had social control during the war into the post-war period, because armed actors have, an, have strategic reasons for wanting to control territory, for wanting to control certain areas. There's also a socialization mechanism here, potentially on the, on the part of uh, armed actors, in the sense that armed groups or members of armed groups, or elites, um, might have become accustomed to positions of power during the war. So they had a certain role in their community during the war, um, and they might want to keep, you know, have that role into the post-war uh, period. They see it as their role, their purpose, to uphold order, the order they were creating during the war, and to keep doing so into the post-conflict era. So those are two mechanisms sort of on top down, and by top down I mean sort of motives on the part of the armed actors for wanting to maintain social control into the post-conflict period, and why we would see these practices endure. 
Then there's also a bottom-up or potentially a bottom-up mechanism uh, based on socialization. So civilians may come to rely on informal institutions for their quote unquote strategies of survival. And in areas where armed groups developed informal institutions during the war, and in the case of Northern Ireland during 30 years of conflict, people may have come to accept and internalize norms stipulating that governance or certain aspects of governance, in the case of Northern Ireland, so community policing, was done and done better by non-state groups rather than the state. So there's a, you know, so there's a bottom-up socialization in the sense that this is not just driven by top-down what armed actors want, there's also a demand bottom-up uh, from population, uh, from the population. So that's our, you know, or the mechanisms that would underpin why these practices might endure from the war into the post-war period. And if this is right, there's a couple of things we expect to see. So one, we would expect that after the war, armed actors will seek to exercise social control in areas where there were well-developed informal institutions during the war. So we expect some geographic persistency of where these, where these things are happening. And the second, in order to sort of differentiate, well, is this really driven by this top-down or these bottom-up mechanisms? We suggest that if the geographic persistence of informal institutions from the conflict into the post-conflict period is also driven by civilian socialization, then civilians living in areas controlled by armed groups are likely to rate informal authorities highly and they're likely to be skeptical of formal authorities. So we would expect to see, you know, there's something here about the attitudes of the population. So those are the two propositions that we then we test in, in this study. So how do we do that? Um, so our research design, there's lots of you know, bits and pieces to it. We try to throw lots of things at it to see what's going on there. So we, um, we uh, rely on you know, secondary sources and also interviews and archival uh, work um, from, the, um, from, uh, from the troubles, what was going on during the troubles, particularly to establish you know, where and how were wartime institutions uh, developed. We've conducted end of interviews with stakeholders, that was in, in 2018. And to establish where dissident groups are active, we map in-group killings during the troubles. And I'll talk, we'll talk more about, I'll talk more about this measure in a minute, but we, we tried to map where groups had social control during the troubles and we rely on a measure, we use a measure for in-group killings um, to establish that. And then we match that or try to see, does that match where we're seeing uh, these kinds of attacks happening in the post-conflict period? And then to assess the effectiveness of social control post-conflict or to see you know, what do, how do people rate informal versus formal authorities, we rely on the survey that we conducted in 2016. So let me talk a little bit about each of these bits and pieces of evidence uh, here. In terms of the history, we outline how areas in Northern Ireland came to be under the control of paramilitary, um, paramilitary groups. And there's some, um, so in the, when the, when the troubles first began, um, the it began, of course, as a sectarian conflict where you have these communities became pitted, came pitted against one another. And the sectarian violence led to the development of so-called no-go areas. And the reason for this is that when the sectarian, in 1969, sectarian violence became um, so severe that it was, uh, that the British government decided that, well, we need an army on the streets here. The police can't handle this. Now, when the army uh, entered, the police withdrew and withdrew from certain areas. And in these areas where the police, with, uh, from which the police uh, withdrew, there was a policing vacuum in the sense that, you know, ordinary or ordinary crimes, you know, antisocial behavior, these things continued, but there was no police for people to go to. So people started turning to the paramilitary groups. And when we, sp we spoke to um, members or former members of paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland, and the way they described it was that, you know, they weren't, this wasn't something they set out to do. There wasn't a, 
sort of purposeful plan from the beginning that we want to take on policing functions. But people came to them and they sort of reluctantly took on this role. And initially, you know, they saw this as this is taking away from you know, what the key struggle is about. The key struggle is about fighting in, in the Republican communities, fighting the British states. But, you know, we're also going to take care of these law and order uh, problems, this more administrative, uh, this administrative aspect of it. Um, so they dedicated people to deal with community policing. And they came to realize over time that, well, actually this serves, you know, this has a purpose. It can help us by, you know, giving us support in the communities and, you know, establishing control within the communities. We also saw this develop in uh, loyalist, uh, loyalist areas because also there, there was a policing vacuum. So these institutions emerged, you know, as a, a bottom up demand during the troubles where people came to the paramilitary groups and expecting them to take on policing functions, particularly to deal with things like antisocial behavior. Joyriding is one thing that is very often brought up as an example. So we, you know, we see this development um, and what's important about this historical bit of our analysis is that we're establishing, well, what did these institutions look like? That this was mainly about the kind of public good that was provided, it was mainly about policing within the communities. It happened in both communities um, and that it was the result of the troubles. This is, these are not practices that were there before the conflict, but they emerged during the trouble. So that's the historical bit of our, uh, our, our analysis. Then, you know, having established, you know, that these practices emerged uh, in certain areas during the troubles, um, then we have this proposition. So after the war, we suggest armed actors will seek to exercise social control in areas where they were well-developed informal institutions during, uh, during the war. And this is where we expect this geographic persistence. So how do we go about you know, figuring out this geographic um, persistent. So in order to establish where groups are exercising social control after uh, the Good Friday Agreement, we rely on these data from the police service of Northern Ireland that I showed you early on about these paramilitary style attacks. Um, so areas where you see Republican or loyalist groups carrying out attacks within their own communities. And these can be both beatings and shootings. So that's, and we have what we, we got from the police service in Northern Ireland, we got to geolocated data for where these attacks are happening. So we can map them out. Now, similar data does not exist uh, for the period of the troubles itself. So what we rely on there is uh, a measure of in-group killing. So um, reports of uh, Republican paramilitary groups during troubles killing members of Catholic, the Catholic community and similarly for loyalist groups. So loyalist paramilitary groups killing members of the Protestant communities. And we also geolocate those attacks. Now, of course, you know, these attacks are at the tip of the iceberg in the sense that, as I said earlier, there is this, you know, system of informal justice where it starts with a warning and then there might be, you know, another warning. So, you know, you don't get to a killing until quite sort of high up in the system of punishment. So in that sense, it's a fairly conservative measure of where groups exercise social control during the troubles. Now, you, you know, relying on these data where groups exercise social control with this fairly conservative strict measure from the troubles and then our data on paramilitary style attacks, we can map where these you know, things happen during the Troubles and afterwards. And here you see a map of informal justice in Belfast. Um, and so the, it shows you data um, of, um, of uh, where you are seeing attacks happening. And on the first map here, you see where in-group killings were happening during the Troubles. And then you see on the second map, where paramilitary style attacks have happened after the troubles. And the red ones are loyalist attacks and the red areas here are uh, majority uh, Protestant areas. And then the green attacks are attacks carried out by uh, um, Republican paramilitary groups in the green areas and predominantly Catholic, uh, Catholic areas. And there are two things you, know, you see here that these attacks are mainly in group Right? So that you have you know, green attacks happening in green areas, red attacks mainly happening in red areas. So they are in group policing. And then you see just by looking at this map, right, you see that there, you know, there is an overlap of where these attacks were happening during the troubles and where they are happening afterwards. And we've, you know, we mapped this out for all of Northern Ireland. This figure here just shows, uh, shows you Belfast. 
Now, what we also do uh, is to see, well, you know, of course, there might be other reasons for why certain areas in the post-conflict period is experiencing paramilitary-style attacks. It might be you know, that this has to do with these attacks are more likely to happen in poor, poor areas, in urban areas, uh, in areas that are sort of community strongholds. And we run a, a couple of regression analysis using uh, data to try to sort of control for the fact that there might be other things that are accounting for why these attacks are happening where they are happening today. And what we find, and I'm going to just show you the, the results here, is that the number, these are these measures for in group killings from the conflict, uh, from the troubles, will, are still statistically significant and related to uh, where attacks are happening today. So that's our the first two variables you see here. So you see that Catholic in-group killings are positively and significantly related to where you're seeing paramilitary style attack, uh, attacks, Republican paramilitary style attacks happening in the post-conflict period, and the same for Protestant in-group killings. So that gives us some confidence that, you know, we're not just seeing this in, in these maps. This also, you know, shows up as being important when we control for a whole range of other factors that of course may also account for why we're seeing some neighborhoods be more likely um, to see paramilitary style attacks today. Now I'm gonna give the word to Kit because he will talk a bit more about, so Kit is the one who has created these maps uh, and who's also run this analysis and has done a lot of work trying to assure us that these measures that we have are good measures. I'm going to give the word to Kit and then I'm going to come back to, back to you and talk a bit more about, well, what do people who live in these areas where you see these attacks happening today, what do they think of informal and formal authorities to test the second uh, proposition? Thanks, Kristen. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Kit. Uh, thank you so much for, 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 for inviting us here to talk today. So I thought it'd be interesting uh, at this stage of the presentation to take almost like a sidestep and discuss our measure for social control. Um, so, as you can see, the measure for social control in the post-conflict period here is the number of parliamentary style assaults in an area. And the areas that we use are census areas. They're called super output areas. They exist in the UK, uh, and so they exist in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think this is important because it's an important feature of our paper. So it's the outcome uh, variable for the first proposition, which Kristen has just outlined, but it's also the main key independent variable or the main predictor for a second question, uh, which, which Kristen's, Kristen's gonna outline afterwards. So what I particularly like about the next few slides is that it shows the uh, you know 80% of ideas, research and work that never makes it into a, a journal article. But I do think it's interesting to discuss it uh, especially when you know we have 40 minutes or, or, or longer today to discuss this uh, and it kind of gives a, a, a tick description I think and I learned a lot doing it uh, about Northern Irish society today so when we approached this project our question from the start was this kind of puzzle right why are these attacks happening in certain areas in, in, in Northern Ireland and what we thought those attacks were we thought they were an indication of some kind of attempt to have social control over certain communities and so we thought okay so the, the overall question is you know how do you measure paramilitary control right how do you know that these attacks are happening in places that paramilitary groups are, are trying to control and so just a side note on the data that we use uh, it took us a year of emails uh, a meeting in person with the psni uh, and a non-disclosure agreement to get the data for the article uh, that you've just seen in the maps um, uh, and, and you know, we, we can't share that data uh, for a really good reason uh, in that it's highly accurate GPS coordinates um, and it could be used to, to identify uh, victims. I mean, an important point here, and I think Kristen presented it quite nicely at the start of the talk, is some of the attacks are surprising, they'll happen in the street. Some of them will be by appointment, which is described in the quote also. Uh, but for those who don't turn up for appointments, a lot of them happen in the home. And when they happen in the home, they're particularly brutal. Uh, uh, and so our data reflects that. So a lot of the data that we have will show you the, the home of the victim, right? Um, but we were never sure if we were gonna get this data, right? Which is highly, uh, or highly uh, accurate uh, geographically, but also uh, disaggregated over time. And so for a year, uh, I spent, which in hindsight, of course, was a complete waste of time, but uh, I spent a year collecting alternative data that I thought we could use to measure social control. 
So I talk about discuss it now, and it kind of opens a kind of discussion about how do you even measure the, these kind of things that we're interested in. Um, and you know, like I say, it's the eighty percent that never ever gets on print. So the first idea was to use news reports um, uh, from let's say nineteen ninety eight till the present day, which at the time was twenty seventeen. Uh, but we quickly realized that they would overrepresent Republican attacks. Uh, most Republican attacks, which uh, you can see in the, in the first in the first few slides that Kristen presented, um, involve firearms, uh, whereas loyalist attacks uh, involve uh, predominantly kind of blunt instruments, so you know baseball bats and, and sticks. Um, so firearms are less dis are less discreet in their, and they're less discreet, and in urban areas, you know, they're more likely to be known uh, and reported by the media. So we decided not to use uh, the the news reports, but you know. If you can't get the data from the PSNI, this probably is the best kind of alternative to the data that we have. Uh, and there are people collecting this data. For example, uh, the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, ACLED, has expanded, uh, has expanded to include uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, and I think they're releasing their first kind of batch of information, uh, which will be from 2020 onwards in January. Um, we also thought of using hospital reports, but again, shootings are more. Uh, obviously an attack than a beating and so beatings might might again be underreported. I mean this is interesting to think you know when is a, a, a beating a beating you know a slap in the face is also some kind of form of punishment but might not enter your your, your recording you, you might not record it as a, a punishment attack. In any case with, for the for the hospitals uh, there, there, there are few hospitals in Northern Ireland so um, it wouldn't really give you an indication of where these attacks are occurring and the likelihood of getting I mean, we have no interest in, in getting uh, hyper-personal information on, on patients, right? So um, it wouldn't give you an indication of where they're occurring, but it, def it would give you some kind of uh, temporal variation. So you could see peaks in, in, in times when they are attacks. Um, and so in light of those kind of uh, issues, I, I actually started coding additional measures of, of, of control, which never made it in the paper. I'm going to describe, describe these, right? So maybe, Kristen, you can go to the next slide. So the thinking behind the, the measure was, okay, uh, what we could get is some kind of coarse measure of paramilitary violence from news reports, and we could bolster it up by combining it with other measures uh, that might make an area, that we think theoretically might make an area more susceptible to control by paramilitary groups. Um, other measures you know, might include you know, like the concentration of a certain community in an area. So whether it's 90% Catholic or 90% Protestant, according to census data, but also uh, deprivation in an area, or, or um, in our case, what we tried to do is, well, we would have used those, but um, collect geospatial data on community organizations, which may be used by paramilitary groups to kind of maintain social links. And the, the kind of obvious community organization that I didn't uh, code was churches, but uh, Joseph Brown at University of Mass Massachusetts he has uh, coded those. Um, what I decided to collect was uh, data on the locations of GAA clubs. So the GAA is a Gaelic Athletics Association, and the locations of Orange Halls, which are clubs associated to the Orange Order. So, you know, the GAA is a sporting organization for Irish sports. Um, in Northern Ireland, most GAA members uh, are Catholic. Uh, that's reflected in uh, national surveys in Northern Ireland, uh, the Life and Times survey. Um, it does have links to the conflict in the sense that police members from and you know members of security forces more generally could not become members of the GAA uh, up until uh, I, I, I won't say here because I can't remember, but fairly recently, let's say. Um, the GAA is also like this whole island association. There's no border in the GAA, uh, so it, it does symbolise uh, this kind of. Uh, uh, United Ireland kind of political aspirations for, for many kind of Republican uh, members of the community. Um, many of the clubs are also named after prominent Republicans. I think the, the kind of the most the most obvious case of this is Casement Park in, in Belfast, which is the GAA stadium. And it's named after uh, Sir Roger Casement, who, you know, for uh, Irish Catholic Republican people uh, is, uh, you know, the name of a hero, but for uh, British people, uh, you know, even in the UK, you would you would associate him more as a as a villain historically, right? because you know he he brought weapons to Ireland and was executed 
Um, and he was a sir, so he was knighted by Queen Amanda. So it's a, a very symbolic, right, to, to name a, a club after someone like that. Um, then the other group, the other community organization, which we thought would kind of capture uh, whether community was susceptible, right, uh, was the Orange Order. Um, this is a brotherhood which is loosely based on the organizational structure of the Freemasons. It's a Protestant fraternal order uh, and it plays a really important role in marching and parades in Northern Ireland. And I think anyone who knows anything about Northern Ireland will know that that is incredibly important. Um, plays an incredibly important role culturally and historically for the Protestant community in Northern Ireland. Um, and I, I wrote when I was right now what I was going to say, I wrote most uh, members are Protestant. I think it's probably safe to say that all members of the Orange Order are, are Protestant. So how was I going to get the data? Uh, so the GAA was really easy because it's online. So I just coded it based off the addresses and I got 261 GAA clubs in Northern Ireland. So that excludes uh, three counties. So the way it's structured is the provinces of Ireland, it's Ulster. So it's just the six counties of Northern Ireland. Uh, the Orange Order, it was a lot more complicated and a lot more fun. And actually told me, I learned a lot more about Northern Ireland trying to code the Orange Order, uh, the Orange Halls than I did uh, the GA clubs. So the Orange Order is a secretive and a extremely decentralized uh, structure where members can uh, basically um, set up their own uh, hall uh, with relative ease. So I could set up a hall in my, in my shed, for instance. Um, so I first contacted the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland and. Uh, I think they were somewhat surprised that I contacted them uh, and they told me that they didn't have a list of all the halls and the addresses, but they told me that there were, you know, in and around 600 halls in Northern Ireland. And so that was nice because I, I thought, okay, that's something to aspire to, 600. Uh, I then did a freedom of information request to the Northern Irish Department of Justice because I thought it might have a list of halls just for security reasons. Um, because I know uh, from growing up that halls sometimes are targeted uh, for a, you know, sectarian attacks against the actual building that the halls are in. They sent me a list of halls which were subject, to, uh, uh, which were subject of uh, compensation claims uh, as a result of receiving criminal damage. But they never told me what the time span was. But in any case, I got 50 halls that way. And the 50 that I got were in predominantly Catholic areas. So these were probably the result of kind of sectarian attacks on the halls themselves. Um, the parading, so parading is a huge part in Northern Ireland, as we as I, I've said, and many parades, they start or end at an orange hall. So um, so I know that from reading, and uh, it does, if you read anything about the parades, this is kind of becomes quite clear quite, obvious, quite early. Um, I contacted the Parades Commission in Northern Ireland, and I got the routes for all the parades in 2016, which, which amounted to over 3,000 routes. Um, and this allowed me to identify a further 138 halls, because it actually provided the address where it started and ended, and whether or not it was at an orange uh, hall. And then finally, I did a, I crawled through Google Maps, I did this kind of Google Map crawl, and I got another 119 halls. And so in the end, I had uh, 263 halls, which is just over a third, and probably many more exist. And in hindsight, and I found all this out after having coded all the halls, uh, Eric Kaufman at Birkbeck. Uh, has a collection of the locations of halls, and I think he's got somewhere near like 500 halls. So it was all a waste of time. But uh, mapping them out, Kristen, could you show the next slide? Um, I think is quite neat, right? So uh, this is Belfast. Um, the yellow lines show interface areas. The green dots are GA clubs. The orange dots are orange halls. Uh, the triangles are Sinn Féin. Offices. That was another thing I thought we could use as a kind of measure because, you know, Sinn Féin office on the Falls Road, for instance, you know, it, it has a long history and a long association with the, with the community. Um, uh, but the DUP offices was definitely a bad measure in hindsight because their relationship with the, let's say, loyalist communities is, is not as clear cut as the Republican, relation, or the Republican community's relationship with Sinn Féin. Um, but in any case, if you look at Belfast, what's obvious is that GA clubs probably do capture some kind of uh, communal kind of strongholds, let's say like a, an association, places that you might think are susceptible, if combined with other measures, to kind of uh, paramilitary social control. As in, they're like rich, fertile kind of ground to, to do that. But the orange halls um, don't, don't seem to, to capture that in urban areas anyway, uh, in Ireland, in Belfast anyway. Uh, 
Um, next slide, please. Here is uh, South Armagh, so Newry, this is on the Irish border. Uh, this, during the Troubles, was referred to as bandit country. It's, uh, you know, a, a provisional IRA during the Troubles and a provisional IRA stronghold. Um, and so what you can see here is you get a lot of these GAA clubs, as you would expect. You also get some orange halls, um, but you don't get very many orange halls. And what's interesting is, you know, GAA clubs are almost always uh, it's very hard to find GA clubs that are not in areas which are predominantly Catholic. Um, but you do get these orange order, orange halls in areas that are predominantly Catholic, and they're probably the ones that I got from the Department of Justice, right? Um, next slide, please. This is a North Down, which is a predominantly Protestant area, and so you can see there, like the GA clubs, uh, there just are no GA clubs in the in the predominant more. Protestant areas, but you can see that the orange halls are, are, are well represented there. And then one final uh, map, which is Derry. Um, and you can see here that the Sinn Féin office is in, I think it's in Craigan. So, and Rosebank, um, I, I'd have to check. Um, but uh, you see, the measures that we were using, if combined, you may have kind of created some kind of uh, index of social control, but I think they would definitely have been you know, subject to much debate. Um, but what I think was nice about this data is that it sheds light on the, the kind of communal, commu intra-communal relations in, in, in Northern Ireland, and it shows just how segregated they are, but how, how easily it maps onto spatial, spatial segregation. And then the last thing is we use a indicator of uh, social control during the Troubles, which is the number of in-group um, killings. So that's uh, a Catholic person being killed by a Catholic group or a Republican group, and a, a Protestant person being killed by a Protestant or a Loyalist group. Um, but as an alternative for these no-go areas, uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide, it's fine. Um, we thought, okay, so the no-go area, so as an alternative for, for this measure, we thought, why don't we use the no-go areas? Because we know that these no-go areas emerged, that they were controlled by these groups, that even when the uh, army moved in in 1972 and reoccupied these areas, that the, the paramilitary groups continued to exercise social control through these informal systems. And so um, uh, I, I went to the um, National Archives in London and I got the mission outline for Operation Mulligan. And here are the photos of just some of the pages. I mean, there's tons of pages. Um, but uh, this is the mission outline by Lieutenant General Sir Harry Tuzo. And based on this, I, I coded places that you could identify um, and associate with the unit, uh, or the kind of modern day census unit uh, today. And so you can see that there, there are these, if you know Belfast or if you know Northern Ireland, you've recognised these areas, uh, Turf Lodge, Ardoin, New Lodge. These are areas that are, you know, predominantly, these are areas that we would expect to see. These are also predominantly Catholic areas. Uh, and you can see that they do this across Ireland on the, on the right hand, right? Um, and when you map these out, and that's the next slide, please, you see these, these are those in the no-go areas in Belfast in 1972. And again, if you know, uh, Northern Ireland, or if you know Belfast, you'll see that Protestant areas are really underrepresented. Um, this is not because they didn't have no-go areas, but uh, this is because they weren't considered a security threat and they weren't the target of Operation Modem. Um I could potentially get in trouble for just saying that, right, with no evidence. Uh, so uh, actually, it's quite obvious that this was the case in the mission outline. And in the next slide, if Kristen could just show, yep, yeah, there we go. So. Um, this is just one excerpt, but you'll see plenty of excerpts like this, which um, which shows this kind of partial uh, nature of uh, Operation Motorman. Uh, and I think generally, if you see a document that says appear impartial, it probably is partial. So I'll just read it out very quickly. Units with Protestant barricades in their areas, so obviously there were some, are to arrange the removal of these barricades, which will have to be taken down very shortly after H hour because of the need to appear impartial. Military assistance is to be offered in the unlikely event of Protestant refusal to remove barricades, they are to be removed by force. However, every attempt is to be made through negotiations at ground level to ensure that this situation does not arise. What's really interesting in the mission outline is that they are told to tell, you know, the paramilitary groups, the kind of local elites in these areas that they can continue uh, their, their, their 
what they have been doing so, and they refer to like administering justice, uh, but that they have to remove the barricades in order to appear in court. So that's the end of my side note. In the end, uh, I think we have a really good measure uh, of social control, both during and after the conflict, because it's dynamic, right? I mean, it changes over time. The ones I've just outlined, they don't change over time. They, they're, once they're built, they're there. In the same way as once a place is a no-go area, it always is a no-go area. Whereas ours, they change over time and they're more fine-grained, right? It allows us to answer the first question about geographic persistence, which Kristen did a really neat job of, of describing. But they also, uh, uh, which I think would, I think, you know, if we hadn't the data, we wouldn't be able to answer that question, the data that we have. Um, the other thing is, you know, in this kind of uh, waste bin of ideas, uh, I learned a lot about Northern Ireland and, and its history in, in my attempts to find an alternative measure uh, that I hope that you know, some of you may have found interesting. So I'll hand it back to, to Kristen, who's going to talk about the second proposition of our theoretical argument. Uh, and uh, I look forward to your Q and for the, to the questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Kit. Um, I'm glad we had this opportunity to actually share with you some of the, all these data collection efforts we've gone through, and Kit in particular has gone through, to try to, you know, how do we measure social control, uh, to try to do that in different ways. Um, so, but the measures we use are, of course, in the post-war period, is measures of paramilitary style attacks and in-group killings from the troubles. Now, the second proposition we had was about, well, is this bottom-up socialization. So, you know, do these institutions persist due to civilian socialization? So how can we figure that out? And I'm showing you these slides, these pictures in this slide here, because these are public campaigns in Northern Ireland that are aimed at getting the public um, aware of that these attacks are happening and making the public stop turning to paramilitaries. So the first is just a picture for the stop attacks video from a public uh, campaign uh, which sort of informs people about, you know, these practices are potentially dangerous for you and for the communities. And then you see the second one, it's a photo from a couple of years ago uh, on a bus stop in Belfast. Um, paramilitaries don't protect you, they control you. So clearly these attacks are aimed at the public, sort of recognizing that there are members of the public who do go to these groups and who do somehow, it's not just a top-down thing, right? So, but beyond you know, knowing that there are these public campaigns uh, which suggest that there is something about the public finding uh, or there is something to this bottom-up mechanism, um, how can we try to figure that out more systematically? And, sorry, um, I'm just gonna make sure. Yeah, okay, I'm there. Um, so what we do is that we rely on survey data. Right. So just a reminder of our, our, of our second proposition. So if the geographic persistence that we saw of informal institutions from the wartime, from war into the post-conflict period, is also driven by civilian socialization, we would expect civilians who live in areas that are controlled by armed groups, so where these attacks are happening today, to be likely to rate informal authorities highly and be more skeptical of formal authorities. Right? So that's our expectation. And we get at this by using um, survey data, but also based on our fieldwork. So let me talk a bit about our fieldwork highlights first. So we, we spoke to a range of people when we were there. We were only there for a very short fieldwork trip. And we we're also relying, again, on secondary sources and reports and news, newspaper reports. But you know, from the people we spoke to, we certainly got the sense that there is something to both the top-down and bottom-up mechanisms. There are top down, there are armed groups of various motives. You have dissident groups who want to delegitimize the state and remain relevant today. There are also criminal groups who are engaged in extortion. They seek to control the drug business and the areas where they're gonna choose to sort of set up shop are areas where their predecessors, where paramilitary groups had control during the troubles. We can't really distinguish what, whether what's happening is sort of based on political or criminal motives from this top, in this top down mechanism. Bottom up, there is what some of the people we spoke to is a folk memory of going to paramilitary groups within certain communities. And we were told several times that particularly among in Protestant communities that you, you just do not go to the police, right? So 30 years of conflict, 30 years, you know, people have been socialized to over 30 years of conflict, not going to the police. Then there's an also another expectation that it's uh, somehow quicker to go to paramilitary groups. If there's a problem of antisocial behavior in your area, 
it might be quicker and there's sort of a swift or speedy justice by going to the paramilitary groups to get the problem solved rather than going through formal policing channels. So that suggests, you know, just from people we spoke to that there is something to this bottom up mechanism too. Then more systematically, we try to get at this with survey data. And so we have a survey um, that is conducted with uh, colleagues at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. It's a survey called Attitudes uh, to Peace. Um, and it asks people a range of questions about the post-conflict period in Northern Ireland. It's a comparative survey. So we did a similar survey in Guatemala and uh, Nepal as well. But it asks people a range of questions about the post-conflict period and of course the conflict period. Um, and then we pair what people think of formal and informal authorities, I'll show you that in a minute, with whether these people are living in areas that are controlled by paramilitary groups today. So we use the data from the police to figure out if one individual is living in an air area that is controlled by paramilitary groups and whether that then shapes his or her perception of formal and informal authorities. So you know, how do we get at what people think of formal and informal authorities? So we ask people, a question about antisocial behavior. And this, in the scenario, we give them the following scenario. A man lives in a neighborhood where there's a severe problem with antisocial behavior, such as vandalism and car theft. What would he do? And I'm sure many of you, you know, can recognize this scenario from where you're living in, uh, if you're living in the UK. And then for each possible solution presented, the respondent is asked whether it would make no difference, help a little or help a lot in solving the problem to go to a set of authorities. And in order to assess whether people would think it would be useful or help to go to the police, we asked them, you know, how helpful would it be to go to the police? That's our measure for formal authorities. We did not ask them directly how useful it would be to go to paramilitary groups. We were told that, you know, that wouldn't necessarily give us, we wouldn't necessarily be able to get honest answers to that. Um, but also, in part, what we're interested in is not sort of only that people are going to paramilitary groups, but whether people think it's more normal to go to informal authorities, someone that isn't the state, right? So we asked this question, contact a member of the community who has influence. That's our measure, informal authority. And then, and again, you know, people could rate that from it would help a little or make no difference, help a little or help a lot. And then based on these two questions, we create three dichotomous dependent variables. So we, we create a measure for whether people rate the police as more effective, uh, as uh, whether respondents rate the police as effective. So basically whether it will help a little or help a lot versus make no difference. Then we create a measure for whether respondents rate informal authorities as effective. So help a little or help a lot versus make no difference. And then we also create a measure that where based on these two questions, whether people rate the effectiveness of informal authorities as higher than that of the police. So that's a way of, of getting at, you know, what do people think of the uh, of formal and informal authorities? And then what we're really interested in seeing is there a correlation between the, how they rate formal and informal authorities based on whether they're living in areas that are controlled by paramilitary groups today based on the, or measure of, uh, of paramilitary style um, attacks. And I'm just going to show you the main findings here. We also, in the models we run, so we run uh, six different models. We run logit regressions uh, and we, we control again we control for a range of other things that might affect what people think of informal and formal authorities but I'm just going to show you the findings for our, in, our, our main findings for the to make it more readable and simple so these are uh, the regression results logit regressions itself for the key uh, for the key relationships uh, that they find and the red here shows you the rating of the formal authorities um, as effective. The green shows you the rating of the informal authorities as effective, so you know, personal influence as effective. And the blue is whether they rate informal authorities as more effective uh, than the formal authorities. So that's just a coefficient here. And then I'm gonna show you the predicted probabilities, which might be slightly more intuitive uh, to look at. So what we see here uh, for our Catholic respondents, we found that there as the number of 
paramilitary style attacks in the area where they live. So the more sort of control by paramilitary groups there is in the area that they live, the less likely they are to rate the police as effective, right? So there is a correlation, this correlation that we would expect with if you're living in an area of paramilitary social control, you're going to be skeptical to formal authorities. And when we find that among our Catholic respondents, we don't actually find that there's a corresponding uh, relationship where they see informal authorities as effective among the Catholic respondents. We do find that among our Protestant respondents. So Protestant respondents, if they're living in an area that is controlled by paramilitary groups, they're more likely to rate informal authorities uh, as effective. And they're also, um, the sim you see a similar finding when we, we ask them um, this variable that sort of asks them to rate um, informal authorities as, you know, it's informal authority more high, is inf sorry, is informal authority, uh, more effective uh, than the formal authority. And again, we see there's a relationship between, here between living in an area that is controlled uh, by loyalist paramilitary groups and then thinking that informal authorities are uh, more effective than the formal authorities. So this suggests that there, you know, there is also something to these bottom-up mechanisms. So these, you know, the, the, the geographic persistence that we find from the post-conflict from the conflict into the post-conflict period is not driven, we think, just by top-down sort of motives on the part of armed groups. There is also something to what people actually think here that drives the persistence of these practices. We can talk more about in the Q&A about why are there these differences between the Catholic and Protestant areas. We, can, we, we speculate on that. We're not entirely sure why, but we speculate on that in our, in our paper. So, you know, to wrap up, um, so we began with, you know, this puzzle about the persistence of uh, these practices in Northern Ireland, and it particularly perhaps, or at least I, we find it's quite puzzling that these practices persist in Northern Ireland, a relatively strong state, a peace agreement that has, you know, support, is, uh, financial support, public support, uh, and you still see these practices uh, persisting. And we find that, you know, these practices persist from the conflict to the post-conflict period. They're driven both by top-down and bottom-up uh, mechanism, in some ways in a you know, mutually reinforcing way. This has implications for scholarship, for how we think about the legacies of wartime governance. And there is a legacy of wartime uh, governance here that post-war reform efforts are not happening in a governance uh, vacuum. And this has implications beyond, uh, beyond Northern Ireland. The next steps that we wanted to uh, tackle in this project was that we wanted to ask, um, we have another survey that is gonna happen and we actually, we, we put it in the field uh, um, in January last year, but then it was stopped because of COVID and we're hoping we'll be able to pick it up. But in this next survey, what we want to do, we want to um, ask, a, ask people more directly about, we will give them a set of scenarios and ask them more directly whether they would go to paramilitary groups. And we want to try to match areas where we're seeing strong paramilitary social control with areas that are similar on socio-demographic variables that we, where we you know, could expect paramilitary groups to have control, where, but that where they don't have control, to see you know, what is it that's driving differences uh, here. So that would be a more sort of close-up analysis of what's driving these things, whereas the survey we are relying on here is a nationally representative survey. But it would allow, it would allow us to explore these mechanisms more um, in that. I think that's all, all uh, we wanted to say, and we'd love to hear your questions and comments on any part of, uh, of this.